Is there anything better than sharing a Christmas morning with loved ones as wrapping paper is ripped and squeals of delight fill lounge rooms? The Livingston family gathered for their annual get-together complete with Mr Claus and Carols. Lunches for the needy and lonely were provided across the country. In Newcastle, 900 people enjoyed the Samaritans' Fair on the foreshore, almost double the size of last year's gathering. Organisers attributed the increase in numbers to the rising cost of living and the fact Australians didn't get a stimulus payment this year. This has been the busiest Christmas Samaritans has ever had. Uh, at our toy warehouse in Hunter Street, uh, this year we, we saw just over 700 families in just over two weeks. It's a mammoth feast with an army of 170 volunteers turning on Christmas cheer. While most of us are winding down, those involved in midnight masses and daytime church services were at their busiest. At Newcastle's Christchurch Cathedral, regulars and once-a-year churchgoers turned their thoughts to the Christmas story of Mary Joseph and the birth of baby Jesus. And spare a thought for those working today, among them tugboat drivers on the harbour and health workers at the John Hunter Hospital who received a special visitor this afternoon. It wasn't the jolly man in red, but New South Wales Premier Christina Keneally, who thanked staff for their service on Christmas Day. What began as a casual Boxing Day swim for father and son ended with tragic consequences. Around 10 o'clock this morning, the pair ventured in along a section of Lighthouse Beach and quickly found trouble on the incoming tide. Two males are swimming 150 to 200 metres south of the patrol area at Lighthouse Beach. Um, it was a father and son who are on holidays uh, from Melbourne. Caught in a rip and in obvious distress, a member of the public alerted lifesavers. The teenager was quickly rescued, but his 55-year-old father was missing. A search commenced involving the patrol members in their inflatable rubber boats, the jet, Ballon and Jet Rescue Boat Service and jet skis. Uh, the male was located a short time later, approximately 20 minutes later, south of the patrol area, another 200 metres. Lifesavers performed CPR on the unconscious man, but he was pronounced dead at Ballina Hospital. It's the second drowning in New South Wales in less than 48 hours. An 18-year-old man drowned on Christmas Eve at Bato Bay on the central coast, prompting renewed calls to always swim between the flags. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. This P-plate driver was on her way to the Boxing Day races when her Ford Laser collided head-on with a Barina at the busy intersection of Parkway and Stewart Avenues. They were travelling in opposite directions, we understand, and they were turning right against with uh, the traffic signal, but they've come into contact in the middle of the intersection. Lanes on both roads were closed for half an hour. Police are yet to determine who's to blame. Well, at this stage it's a little bit early to speculate about that, but we do know that a 18-year-old uh, girl has been taken off to hospital along with a 60-year-old man. They're both stable. The incidents, police say, is a reminder to drive to conditions. Traditionally, these conditions make it very slippery on the road. Meanwhile, a major operation was underway at the Boxing Day races. 50 officers were on patrol, keeping an eye on the crowd, which was noticeably down due to wet weather. Yeah, that may have dampened some spirits, but those that are here are behaving themselves quite well and we're very pleased thus far with the way things are going. Madeline Bond, NBN News. The Lord Mayor didn't think a proposal by Councillor Aaron Buman to amalgamate 500 councils would get through last week, but it did. You'd wonder why. Well, there's a simple explanation. When the rescission motion uh, about the trees in Layman Street came up, there was a trade-off and a deal done. 
In short, he says councillors agreed to swap votes and that those who wanted the Layman Street fix to stay agreed to support a proposed amalgamation and vice versa. I know they'll deny it, but that's what happened and it really puts Newcastle in a very difficult position. Now, in fact, I'm embarrassed. The alleged deal has also angered Lake Macquarie's Mayor Greg Piper, who's against any amalgamation. Well, it is an insult. Uh, there's no doubt about that, and uh, I think it's uh, somewhat arrogant. But Councillor Buman denies the deal was done and says amalgamating councils makes financial sense. Let's have a look at it. Let's see if um, the mayors have reason to be insulted or reason to stop thinking about themselves and moving ahead. Few races at a Boxing Day meeting like this have been so popular, but with the all-white Opera House stepping out for her debut, it was always going to draw interest. Despite this, her two famous owners, Andrew Johns and John Singleton, were late scratchings. Obviously, getting a helicopter in and out here today, I think he had trouble uh, taking off from where he lives down the central coast. The Ma family wouldn't have missed it for quids after winning a share of ownership in a beer promotion earlier this year. And with Alan Robinson aboard in his return race from suspension, it only added to the hype before they finally jumped in the 1400 metre trip. Carrying the weight of much anticipation, she finished gamely for fifth, but with the promise of things to come. I didn't expect her to win the first race. I mean, not many horses win their first races, but just exciting just being here and being part of the syndicate, it's really good. Rain, hail or shine, punters think the same of Boxing Day at the NJC. There was plenty of that as the festive season continued on its merry way. Even the Mexicans were singing in the rain. And a highly visible police presence was also on hand to ensure the day ended the way it should. Santa is gone and the sales are here. Thousands flocked to Newcastle shopping centres for the first day of the post-Christmas sales and to escape the rain. Finding a park was difficult, but spending money wasn't so hard. Score some bargains? I sure did. 50% uh, off a lot of the stuff. I wait till after Christmas and get them on sale. Lots of kids' toys, that's the plan. Some people are still profiting from Christmas. Just got vouchers and a lot of money. And for others, the presents just keep on coming. It's Lion Guy. Who is it? Lion Guy. As usual, some of the longest lines were found in the homewares departments and at refund counters with people returning unwanted gifts. Management here at Charlestown Square say today's crowd is even bigger than Christmas Eve. Shoppers are spending up on big ticket items like TVs and other electrical goods and also menswear. According to figures from the National Retailers Association, each shopper is expected to part with $250 during these sales. All up, that's more than $14 billion Australia-wide. Kate Mitchell, NBN News.
cruel timing of such a fixture aside, Newcastle offered few excuses despite the lopsided result. You can't go uh, winning every game. No one uh, has done what we've done and, you know, there comes a time when you lose a game. It's obviously disappointing the way we played, mate, and obviously uh, ideally it would have been, uh, would've been nice to get a game a little bit closer, but we had to deal with it and uh, it's no excuse, mate. Returning for the first time since making his A-League debut on the other side of the country, Neil Young made a good fist of things early. But his homecoming would be far from happy. Norm Sekolowski threading through a screamer before Jamie Harnwell found space to double Perth's lead. Luck also falling the home side's way after Lubo Milicevic was ruled to have fouled Milo Stojovski inside the area to put the Perth marksman on the spot. Newcastle stemmed the flow of goals after the break, but not the scoring altogether. As the Jets' frustration extended all the way to the bench. Today, we just went up to it, uh, but we're better than that. and uh, We've shown that over the last few months and we'll show it again. That chance comes against league leaders Melbourne in Newcastle on January 10. Enough time for everyone to cool down and enjoy a break. If you're a tourist and you don't know the area, find the flags when you go to a beach. Uh, look at any warning signs. A busy suburban shopping centre surrounded by police tape after a shooting in broad daylight. Police believe two men became involved in a fight in this car park at about 2.20 this afternoon. It ended with one of the men sustaining a single gunshot wound to his stomach. I was just washing up and I thought, oh, listen to that bang. But I just thought it was the kids out on the street. That's all I thought it was. The victim then walked into the centre and told shoppers he'd been shot. The centre was promptly shut down. Witnesses have told police the offender used a small calibre gun before fleeing the scene on foot. Specialist officers were brought in late this afternoon to canvass the area. At this stage, it's unclear what sparked the fight, but there is speculation it was a domestic incident. Police are hunting for a man described as being aged in his 20s, fairly tall with a thin build. He was wearing a dark hooded jumper and was last seen running down Crowdus Road. Any witnesses are being urged to contact police. Kate Mitchell, NBN News. It's good weather for ducks, but not ideal conditions for a summer holiday. Despite the constant rain, families have packed Lake Macquarie Caravan Parks with row after row full. The Kramer and Mason families come to Belmont every year for their Christmas holidays, but have so far spent this one huddled under the veranda. The weather's terrible. <laughs> it's shocking, but you try to enjoy yourself. Best you can. This is the worst one in 15 years. Some holidaymakers have the perfect setup for all conditions, while others are just trying to stay dry. We just kick back, relax, that's the whole idea. Ride the bikes, go for a swim, even in the rain. Do you wish you had a cabin? No. The rain's great. We can have a rest in between the sun and the surf and the sand and the rest. It's great. <laughs> And children don't seem to be having any trouble finding ways to pass the time either. It's still fun since I've got all my friends here. Kate Mitchell, NBN News. Heavy traffic along the Pacific and New England highways continues and, according to police, it'll become even busier after New Year's Eve as a second wave of holidaymakers head north. We will see traffic start to die down a little bit now until the new year, but early on the new year traffic will increase and people can expect delays, particularly around the Bulladela area and further north around Kempsey. 
We're 10 days into Operation Safe Arrival and the number of speeding tickets issued is up 83 on last year's figure for the same period. 1,230 people have so far been booked in the Hunter. It's amazing how people still insist on speeding and rushing to their destination. And with the roads made greasy by rain and visibility down, the appeal has gone out for drivers to knock 10 kilometres an hour off the speed limit. Particularly with this wet weather, um, people need to take care, be cautious and obey all the road rules. 13,860 breath tests have been conducted with 56 people charged in the Hunter. The good news is that's considerably lower than last year. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. There was only one word on our lips on the morning of September 23rd, dust. The East Coast woke under a blanket of it, an eerie orange glow and a drive to work like never before. It's crazy. I was driving here this morning and it was just, I couldn't even see. Newcastle Harbour took on a new perspective as shipping was shut down. It was chaos at Williamtown as flights were grounded. In early March, motorists were stunned when a cement footbridge came crashing down on the New England Highway at Maitland. A low loader carrying a cherry picker had clipped the bridge. Two trucks were crushed, the drivers somehow only suffering minor injuries. Dusted ourselves off, we have glass, glass all over us and then um, we were thankful that we were all OK. The RTA is planning to build a bridge with a higher clearance. In July, our cameras were there when fire ripped through the Civic Hotel on Hunter Street, an hour after closing time, destroying all four levels. Bushfires burned. In an ominous start to the season, 500 hectares of National Park at Fingal Bay was burnt in late August. The fire, the work of arsonists. In April, there was the story of 26-year-old Jason White, swept into the swollen Hunter River while pushing his 11-week-old son in a pram. Jason was in the fight of his life as he was swept a kilometre and a half down the river when Darrell Slitz appeared on the scene in his kayak. Darrell's likely to be given a bravery award. People Power made news. Textile workers unsuccessfully rallied to save their jobs at the Pacific Brands plant at Cessnock, while man and horse came together at Scone against the proposed Bickham coal mine. And sadly, the Hunter lost its share of identities this year. Blake Doyle, NBN News. A day of tragedy and drama for Newcastle, with at least nine people confirmed dead in an earthquake. A full series of reports in this special edition of NBN News. Good evening, I'm John Church. And good evening from Tracy Reed. The quake, registering 5.6 on the Richter scale, hit the city and surrounding suburbs at 10.30 this morning. And tragically, Newcastle became the first Australian city to have a fatal earthquake. This is how NBN news crews covered the horror hours that followed. What was seemingly a routine story about a bus strike in Newcastle became the now famous footage of the moment the earthquake struck and the confusion that followed. Was it mine subsidence or an explosion at the BHP steelworks? In a few seconds, lives had been snatched away under falling buildings and much of the city's main infrastructure and communications were down. Rescuers were forced to use their bare hands to clear rubble. Well, this is Beaumont Street, Hamilton, just minutes after the blast or the explosion or the earthquake and 
it looks as though a bomb has hit. Bombs have hit all along here. It's like a war scene. People are standing around just dazed. There has been some loss of life, it appears, and buildings all up and down the street have just collapsed into the roadway. The extent of the damage soon became apparent, along with the cause. The focus of the rescue effort shifted to the inner city where the giant Newcastle Workers' Club auditorium had crashed down, plunging people and whole floors into the underground car parks. The nature strip along King Street became a field hospital amid desperate rescue attempts and fears of aftershocks. Elsewhere, the Tyres Hill TAFE was on fire and the BHP was venting gases from its blast furnaces in an emergency shutdown. Patients at the Royal Newcastle Hospital were forced beachside and the Marto became a medical command post. Newcastle itself was fast becoming the centre of national and overseas attention. Disaster relief centres were set up and over coming days the city went into a kind of martial law with troops and police manning roadblocks. Residents and workers queued for passes to get into a ghost town. Around 50,000 buildings were affected and as demolitions and repairs got underway the damage bill reached about $4 billion. Over the next couple of nights, we'll bring you first-hand accounts of the emergency and ask the experts, could this ever happen again? Attempting to boost the profile of Super 14 Rugby, the Waratahs set up camp in Cessnock. With former Newcastle Knight Tamana Tahu and Maitland bred players Jeremy Tills and Luke Burgess in the squad, the Hunter was well represented. There's no certainty with, with, uh, with spots, so I'll be looking to contribute and challenge myself. And you know, I'm, I'm no good if I'm not at my best, so that's what I'll be focusing on. A big year for cricket fans too, with New South Wales taking on Tasmania in a Sheffield Shield clash in Newcastle. Two Nova Castrians were in the thick of the action, with Bert Cockley and Mark Cameron both claiming important scalps. Setting Tassie 350 to win, the Blues bowlers did the job to set up a 114 run victory. It was a good game in the end to be fair, long hard slog but uh, yeah, that's first class cricket. We got six points today so that's all that matters. The Women's Cricket World Cup bowled into town. A few kilometres away, a local teenager created history at Surfest. Merryweather's Philippa Anderson became the first hometown winner of a main event at the contest. Uh, a bit of tears came out actually because this is like, the best result I've ever had. And to win it here, it's like family and friends, it's really amazing. <laughs> South Africa's Travis Logie claimed the Mark Richards Pro. Swansea Belmont once again drew high praise following another successful hosting of the state surf lifesaving titles, where the home club also finished as the Hunters' best. The big events kept coming and they don't get much bigger than the Bulls at the Entertainment Centre. 
After Australia won team honours on night one, 19-year-old Newcastle-based rider Tom McCullum looked to have wrapped up the individual title before Mexican Rocky McDonald produced a 90-point effort to pip the young Australian for the win. Back in the saddle and there was a fairy tale finish in one of the Hunter's highest profile thoroughbred races. Newcastle trainer Chris Lee scoring a memorable win in the Cameron Handicap thanks to Absolutely Fabulous and Robert Thompson. The horse hasn't won for 30 months or something like that, you know, but in saying that she's raced at a very high grade for a long time now, so to um, finally break a drought on a, a big race at home is uh, very satisfying. The win proved to be the mayor's greatest achievement before being retired a few months later. The extent of the damage is still sinking in 24 hours after a fire at Plattsburgh Public School. Vandals set fire to this classroom early Monday morning, destroying everything inside. It has about 29, 30 computers in it that all the students can go to to have lessons and they've all been destroyed. Um, and it was also a sports store room, so we've got thousands of dollars of sporting gear involved. It's always upsetting when anything you own is ruined. Um, teachers put in a lot of effort for the classes so yeah it's upsetting when anything you own is wrecked. Education Department insurance assessors were at the school this morning tallying the damage and getting the ball rolling on repairs but the classroom will be out of action for the start of the 2010 school year. The fire is just the latest in a long line of break-ins this year and despite pleas, Plattsburgh still doesn't have a security fence. Teachers and the PNC believe a fence like this one at the nearby high school could help prevent such attacks. I think they do in other schools so it would be very good if we could have one, yes. The Education Department says the fence situation will be reviewed but can't say whether the school is in line to get one anytime soon. Kate Mitchell, NBN News. This is Jody Adams in Vietnam teaching invaluable first aid. 
She used her experience as a paramedic and nurse to teach Vietnamese people how to better look after themselves. In some villages, there are no ambulances and locals can't afford to see a doctor, but they also can't afford to miss work because of illness. Now back in Newcastle, Jody met up with her translator, Ko, today, who through World Relief Vietnam helped pass on the first aid knowledge. The idea of promoting recovery for the patient is very important because if the patient is injured, they can't go to work and then they can't feed their family. Ko and his family travelled to Australia for their son's graduation and to learn more about the medical resources available here. About 20 Australian teams head to Vietnam each year to do this kind of educational work and Jody and Ko are encouraging nurses and paramedics in the Hunter to take up the cause. It's a wonderful way to use the skills that you've learnt and it's also a, uh, a wonderful way to put back into the community. It was a case of child abuse that shocked a nation. On trial, the parents of the little girl known only as Ebony starved to death in a rented home at Hawks Nest. East Maitland Court heard over five weeks the shocking details of a starvation, the court hearing how Ebony weighed just nine kilos when she died. Her mother was jailed for life, her father to spend at least 12 years behind bars. The ombudsman claiming the whole thing could have been avoided if docs and the Department of Education had coordinated properly. Former Swansea MP Milton Orkopoulos had his day in court, appealing his sentence for child sex crimes and drug supply. The 51-year-old had three months shaved off his nine-year sentence. In September, decorated ambulance officer David Higgins was sentenced to 10 years for attempting to strangle his former de facto and burn down her home two years earlier. A Newcastle mother was sentenced to 50 hours of community service after telling her daughter to break another girl's nose during an organised park fight. Disturbingly, it was all captured on a mobile phone. And the NRL's year of shame ended on the sorriest of notes. Newcastle Knight Danny Wicks charged with supplying and possessing ecstasy and amphetamines. He was immediately stood down by the club. Tragedies were an unfortunate part of the news in 2009. In May, two men were buried while digging a trench at East Maitland. 29-year-old Tim Haynes died, while a 43-year-old man was pulled from the dirt after being trapped for 20 minutes. The Hunter's aviation industry was in shock in June when a microlight piloted by Bruce Clark crashed just after taking off from Rutherford Aerodrome. Mr Clark had been flying for 30 years. And the carnage continued on the Hunter's roads. In the early hours of October 7, a sedan carrying six people left Duffy Road near Cessnock, smashed into a tree, burst into flames and split in two. 15-year-old Cassandra Ford and 13-year-old Jade Duncan were killed, while the lives of four others were changed forever. Blake Doyle, NBN News. The post-Christmas sales were in full swing in Newcastle, but a bus strike meant fewer people could get into the city to shop or attend the regular bingo day at the Workers' Club. NBN journalist Ross Hampton and cameraman Stuart Osland had been sent to cover the bus strike, an assignment that was about to become the story of the year. And then, of course, I rolled the camera. <laughs> we're part of the way into the interview, and the next minute I could feel there was no noise. That's the odd thing about it. I could feel the land, like the ground I was standing on. Next minute, we were thrown up in the air. As if by second nature, the crew began coming to terms with what had happened. You just plonk the camera on your tripod, turn it on, and then you try and capture as best you can the bits that are happening, the bits that mean things. I filmed every little bit that was different. And this was vastly different. The striking bus workers were soon pressed into service, ferrying injured people from the nearby Beaumont Street in Hamilton, where paramedic Alan Playford had just arrived to help. 20 years on, the memories are still vivid. Our day ended in Beaumont Street quite abruptly and, um, and we moved on to the Workers' Club. But I think one of the most memorable things here was putting people on to a fellow called Eddie King, who was a bus driver, Eddie King's uh, government bus, and he was driving people to the hospitals, and, 
and singing Christmas carols to them in the, in the bus. Incidentally, I was a young cameraman filming the damage from the NBN helicopter and later met up with Alan at the collapsed workers' club. One of the most incredible uh, in trap situations I've worked in. For the rest of my life, Andy, I will never ever be able to forget Norm Duffy and, um, and the way he behaved in the bottom of that uh, place. And they were uh, covered by an immense array of poker machines some metres above them and a labyrinth of uh, concrete and um, reinforcing steel that had sprung out of the concrete everywhere. Here was Norm acting in uh, a way that I'll never ever forget. But I've never seen someone who was facing his own death with absolute no care and concern for himself but all for every, his concern for everyone else, including me. Norm lost his wife of 38 years in the workers' club collapse and he was close to death himself when finally freed after five hours. Norm, you've gone through so much yet you're still smiling. How do you manage to... Uh, that's false, man. False. I'm trying to avoid that the other thing, you know. Till I get out. Get away from that. Norm passed away just last year. Alan Playford attended his wake. Tomorrow night, how Newcastle healed and how a nation learnt from the disaster. Andrew Lobb, NBN News. I think in 2005 we matched them man for man and boat for boat but we just made some mistakes and we didn't get there so to come back now and do it quite convincingly and pretty nice to be in here now and they're then still out there. The season started with a point of difference. Newcastle's NRL club strengthened ties with the real NRL, conducting a player draft which would see fringe first graders and top junior knights aligned with teams in the local competition. Hooker George Nadera proved one of the biggest hits, helping Curry Curry into the preliminary final. As their cauldron underwent further improvements, the Knights enlisted some high-profile help to bring back the fans. As usual, injuries took their toll, but there was still plenty to cheer about, with several Knights earning representative jumpers. Kurt Gidley followed in the footsteps of Andrew Johns and Danny Badiris, named as New South Wales captain, while James McManus made his Blues debut. But Queensland ensured that neither went home with fond memories. A bit embarrassed, I suppose, a couple of errors in the second half. Uh, yeah, it's disappointing. The club then opened its doors to a television crew in a bid to improve its image as the game copped another black eye. But a short time later, Newcastle was back in the headlines. Having completed a player clean out, coach Brian Smith turned his back on the club, signing a lucrative long term deal with the Roosters. 
Initially given the full support of the board, a run of losses saw Smith sacked with a handful of games remaining, replaced by his assistant Rick Stone. The Stone Age got off to a flying start as the Knights qualified for the finals for the first time since 2006. There was a typical send-off from the faithful, but injuries proved costly for Newcastle as the Bulldogs sent them packing. There's always next year, there's always next year. You don't get too many cracks at it. You only get to play semis once, once every year and, and she's all over this year. But the year wasn't over for everyone with the likes of Wes Nagama and Junior Sow selected in their respective national teams, while Gidley retained his place in the Kangaroo squad for the Four Nations series. Danny Badiris got tongues wagging as his new book gave an insight into the Brian Smith clean-out, but the former captain was still welcomed home with open arms. As the year drew to a close, the club announced it would field a third team next season, heading up a squad based on the Central Coast to contest the New South Wales Cup. But just as things began to build for 2010... We have stood um, Danny down effective immediately and indefinitely. Um, pending the outcome of the investigations. The incident ensuring a restless Christmas break for the red and blue. Fireworks will light up Newcastle's night sky at 9 o'clock and also at midnight to usher in 2010. Police are expecting tens of thousands of revellers and they're hoping it will be a peaceful New Year's party. They've rostered on more than 100 officers to conduct random breath tests on local roads as well as alcohol searches and patrols on the foreshore. It is an alcohol-free zone which means that any alcohol brought in by any individual can be confiscated and removed from the area. Police will have any antisocial behaviour squarely in their sights. It is a zero tolerance approach. The normal curfews and closure times will still apply to licensed premises. As for transport... I would suggest very, very strongly that people look at either coming into town via train, um, also from bus and taxis. We have extra uh, buses on, also extra taxis. In the past, Stockton has become a tent and caravan city as people enjoyed one of the best vantage points for Newcastle's pyrotechnics. This year, though, there's a ban on camping with the waterfront reserved for people only. More than 10,000 are also expected at Warners Bay, which will again host music in the podium from 6 and a fireworks display at 10pm. Jane Goldsmith, NBN News. It seems every cloud has a silver lining. Nelson Bay's tourism market is booming despite the worst fears of operators. A bit of fine weather and of course uh, the bookings will finish off for the end of January as well. So uh, yeah, we're looking at a bumper summer, that's for sure. Locals haven't seen it this busy for a long time. This is the, the most people I've seen here in seven years. So yeah, I'm impressed, I'm, I'm having fun. <laughs> Things that would normally keep crowds away have had little effect. Record numbers of holiday makers have braved the weather to swim with the dolphins. 400 visitors left on this cruise alone. The grey skies haven't dampened the spirits of our um, tourists. It's been fantastic. We're still really thrilled with the amount of people that have come to Port Stephens. All 196 berths are full at the marina. Coupled with the new look $700,000 foreshore, New Year's Eve celebrations are set to keep the dollars spinning in.
for an area that thrives on tourist cash. You can look around to the traffic that's moving towards us and um, families setting up utilising the grass area and def definitely into the night as well. I think it's just, you know, it should have been done a long time ago. So fantastic. Nat Wallace, NBN News. Everyone loves a feel-good story, and there were many to take our minds off the economic doom and gloom of 2009. Who could forget Scooby, the King Charles Spaniel, who became an instant celebrity after a five-day ordeal trapped in a cave near Cessnock? Little Chelsea James, who's in remission from cancer, had a brush with fame when she was serenaded by Beyonce at her Sydney concert. It was amazing. It just, it was breathtaking actually. All the way back from the Ronald McDonald house, I couldn't say a word because I, I, it was just breathless. Chelsea went global with the clip a big hit on YouTube. There was the inspiring story of Newcastle's own Billy Elliot, teenager Daniel Raberge. After just 18 months of classical tuition, Daniel is mixing it with dancers who've been performing all their lives on the international stage. Our senior citizens were doing amazing things too. 80-year-old Jack Baldwin is a pretty popular granddad after building his very own roller coaster in his backyard. Oh, real satisfaction there. Yeah. Now that I've done something, that uh, this is going to last for a lot of, a lot of years. We brought you the story of Rob, Warren and Kevin, all in their 70s and playing one of the most brutal sports on the planet, ice hockey. Teenager Ian Fletcher braved the early morning winter chill, surfing more than 200 days in a row for charity. And speaking of charity, there was big-hearted knight Dan Tollar. Sidelined through injury, the big forward took kids from Camp Quality for a night on the town in a stretch hummer every Tuesday. He was a shining light in a horror year off the field for rugby league. And despite his billions, Sir Richard Branson proved he's still a man of the people. He spent 15 minutes shooting the breeze with an NBN crew during a flying visit to Newcastle to check progress on his 32 metre luxury yacht. It's $100,000 a week, including the submarine. <laughs> oh, I might need a pay rise. <laughs> um, there we go, we'll go and, go, go and give him a pay rise. <laughs> Blake Doyle. NBN News. Bondi Junction, Sydney, earlier this month. An extreme example of hoarding. And compulsive hoarding is, is closely linked to OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Professor David Foxley believes many Australians are suffering in silence. Posters like these will hit libraries across New South Wales next week, encouraging the hoarders to come clean. And a thorough assessment is needed to, to find out why they're imbuing such uh, attachment to things that you know, everybody else perhaps has uh, much less attachment to. The experts say there's a little bit of a hoarder in all of us, but the trick is knowing when you've overstepped the mark. I don't think I'm a hoarder. Yeah, but my husband might disagree. Vanessa Revens started collecting vintage clothing when she was 18, but now the 43-year-old has decided to let go. She's selling her prized possessions, albeit because of a lack of room. And I do have a little bit of a stash <laughs> that I don't think I would ever sell. Well, I tell my son he can sell it, you know, later on, when he has to pay for my funeral or something. Nat Wallace, NBN News. Newcastle's cityscape changed. Familiar landmarks fell in great clouds of dust and rubble and its people faced a wake-up call. No one had ever expected an earthquake, but should they in the future? Well, I can say categorically yes. When you look at the history of 1837, 1841, 1842, 1868, 1925, 1989 and then 
uh, just the Ellalong earthquake not far away in 1994. I mean, very strong history of earthquakes here and I, I see no reason why that should stop. The 20th anniversary of the Newcastle earthquake attracted a special convention to the city. One of the good things that came out of the earthquake um, was the formation of the Australian Earthquake Engineering Society and so for the first time ever seismologists and engineers started to talk about the same problem. Just why did the buildings come down? Well number one they weren't designed for earthquakes. The Australian standard at the time held that Newcastle was of zero risk for earthquake. We have introduced two new building codes for earthquakes since the Newcastle earthquake, so um, you know, the, the more recently built buildings will be better prepared, but we still have quite a lot of old buildings out there that are you know, obviously still the same. Others though, such as Christchurch Cathedral, borrowed ideas from the way bombed buildings in Germany were repaired after World War II. Using ingenious expansion glues and steel tie ropes, they're now considered over-designed. Seismologically we realised that we needed better instrumentation particularly in the cities around Australia and um, in the following 12 months there was a joint federal state initiative to actually set up instruments in each of the major cities around Australia. And the other intriguing thing is that the geology in the Newcastle area doesn't really show uh, a level of activity that uh, is comparable with six medium earthquakes in 180 years. So it doesn't look as if it's a long-term thing. For the next 100 years, we'll assume that Newcastle has an above average level of earthquake hazard. Above average, uh, but uh, still more likely not to have it than to have it. Newcastle's Lord Mayor during the earthquake emergency was John McNaughton, and he believes residents largely avoided a second disaster, an emotional aftershock, by telling their stories. Churches, social and service clubs worked closely with psychologists and counsellors to monitor the mental well-being of their members. We kept them here for four years and then when they explained what was happening and asked us to talk among ourselves about what was happening, the whole place relaxed and people went away understanding that the way they felt was not in any way unusual and, the, and telling them what they were going to feel like tomorrow and next week and next month and they were always correct. Only weeks after the quake, 42,000 people and a lineup of Aussie stars crowded into the International Sports Centre to do what they could to help shake the tough times. Nova Castrians, man, and that's why...
Just a season after winning the A-League title, the Jets had the unfortunate honour of claiming the wooden spoon. As the club turned its attention to Asia, the high-profile departures began. Adam Griffiths confirmed he was bound for the Gold Coast and later Saudi Arabia. Mark Milligan and Joel Griffiths, the next to go. I just hope um, there's no ill feelings with the, with the supporters because, you know, I'm sure they're disappointed. Former Central Coast player Sasho Petrovsky made the move up the F3. Perth's Nikolai Topol Stanley, Italian Fabio Vignaroli and former Adelaide defender Angelo Costanzo quickly followed. Dutchman Donny de Groot arrived late, while Lubo Milicevic brought his formidable reputation and experience to the Jets' backline. I've got a lot of good mates in this team and, and, I, and I love the way they try to play. I love the way you know, Gary coaches, you know, he encourages the team to play and that's how I want to play football. The Champions League campaign started poorly, former Newcastle fan favourites doing the damage for Beijing. The next game against Ulsan provided a happy homecoming as Petrovsky endeared himself to the Jets faithful. But the night ended on a sour note, with confirmation keeper Ante Kovic would continue his career in Sweden. The decision I made, I think the majority of people, uh, if they knew the whole detail, would have done it. Things got better from there as the Jets defied the critics to advance past the group stage. But in the round of 16, Newcastle proved no match for a rampant Pohang Steelers. Just when it seemed stability had returned, another bombshell with Gary Van Egmond quitting the club to move to the Australian Institute of Sport, souring his successful stay at Newcastle. The club was quick to appoint Branko Kalina, who had a month to prepare his team for the upcoming A-League season. Despite making a bright start, including a win over the highly fancied Gold Coast, Newcastle hit a form slump, which saw them slip to the bottom of the ladder. Then another blow with confirmation Captain Matt Thompson was headed to new franchise, the Melbourne Heart. But what a difference a few weeks make. A winning streak pushing the club into the A-League top four prior to Christmas and looking forward to a much brighter 2010.